On the morning of March 10, 1997, Leah Rowlands, a 41-year-old mother of two, worked at the Amico gas station just off Interstate 80 in Casa, Nebraska. Before the afternoon arrived, Lee was found shot to death behind the counter. When police reviewed the Amico surveillance footage, they saw that just after 10.30 a.m., a white, barefoot man robbed Leah. After she gave him $150, he ordered her to lie on the ground behind the counter. He then pulled out a gun, leaned over the counter, and shot her three times. After the shooting, the killer went back to his car and drove away, never to be seen again. It's been nearly 27 years since Leah was killed, and the investigators are still searching for the person responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use. So it's interesting that we're covering Leah Rollins this week because this case really exemplifies why we're doing what we're doing here at Detective Perspective. As we go through this investigation and where it stands now, that statement will be more clear, but as I was going through some of the comments this week on the audio version, we had a, uh, a negative comment, and it's very rare. I appreciate everybody who leaves feedback, especially the positive feedback, because it does, like I've said numerous times, really helps helps the show and helps get the word out there about what we're doing. But there was a negative comment, and this isn't about that person, but to paraphrase what their complaint really was, essentially they were saying, hey, listen, Derek's not bringing anything new to the table as far as this particular case was concerned, whatever one they were talking about. And it, it seemed pretty commonsensical uh, what what he had said and what he's talking about. And I'm, I don't really see the purpose uh, of the show. And that's fine. They're entitled to their opinion. But with Leah Rowlands, just like a lot of the other cases we cover, I'm not going to come in here as, let's just call it what it is, essentially a podcaster or a YouTuber, you can call it whatever you want, and solve this case from this desk. It's just not going to happen. There's a reason why these cases haven't been solved to this point. And even if I were the best detective in the world, I'm more than likely I'm not going to be able to contribute in a substantial way from my studio. It's just not going to happen. So why am I doing it? Well, a couple reasons. One, the name of the show is self-explanatory, Detective Perspective. Uh, I am someone who's worked in the field for a very long time, almost 20 years now, and I have a little bit of experience dealing with these types of cases, and I've seen the behind the scenes and and what we do on a daily basis to help solve these cases. So I'm coming to you, just like you guys are watching or listening to this, I'm watching and listening to the case and reading about it, and then giving my opinions from a detective's perspective. Um, they may, in some cases, be a little bit more in-depth. And, and in some situations, they may be more surface level. But here's what's really important. The reason that I'm covering these particular cases is because they're not getting the attention they deserve. There's certain investigations out there that happened 20, 30 years ago, and every single news outlet and uh, streaming service or network is still covering them for whatever reason. Maybe it's the victim that was involved or the facts of the case or the mystery surrounding it. They're beating it to death, no pun intended. But these cases deserve that same level of attention and they're not getting it. So I don't know how big of an impact it's going to have. We'll have to see as time progresses. 
But my hope is that this little show that we have going on here gets out to the people that may be able to help, maybe witnesses or um, people from that community or someone who knows the, the suspects in these cases personally and decides to come forward for one reason or another. I can tell you this, by not covering it, nothing's going to happen. And we're going to be right where we are right now. So again, I, you know, I do have a platform and I'm trying to use it in a way where I can potentially contribute to solving a case, even if that's just telling the story, relaying the information to you guys and having it resonate with someone who can actually do something about this case. So with Leah Rowlands, the reason I bring this all up to not kind of spoil it here, that's what we're really going to be focusing on with this, with this case tonight. There's a lot of evidence with this case as we're going to go over it. And yet 27 years later, we're still sitting here with it unsolved. And as we get into it, it, it's probably going to surprise some of you because there's more evidence in this case than we, than we usually have here on Detective Perspective. So what I'm trying to do is reinvigorate this case, get it back out there. And if most of you are saying, wow, I've never heard of this case, well, then I'm accomplishing what I'm. I'm setting out to do. That's what we're really trying to do here. Bring exposure to these cases for the victims and their families. So I hope uh, I appreciate the comment from the person who had some negative feedback. I, I understand where you're coming from. If you don't know what my intention is, I can see how you would leave this episode uh, or one of these episodes saying, wow, I don't feel like I know what happened. I don't feel like I'm any closer to solving it. That's that that's probably true in most cases, because again, I'm not a magician but what we are doing is if you're hearing about the case and you're leaving here with information about it, that's what it's about. Making sure that in 2024, a case that happened in 1997, you now know about. You may not have been born at the time when it happened, but now you know Leah Rowland's name, you know the case, and maybe you or someone you know will help solve it. So with that all out of the way, I know that was a long one there, I apologize, but I wanted to really get into that tonight. Let's dive into this week's case. Leah Rollins was born on September 25, 1955, to her parents Roy and Mary. She grew up in Pennsylvania with her many brothers and sisters. They remembered Leah as a kind-hearted person. She was generous, got along with people, and had an outgoing personality. In 1984, Leah married a man named Barry. They later moved to Arkansas and had two sons together. They also owned a restaurant in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. In 1995, Leah left Arkansas and moved 700 miles away to Brady, located in the Great Plains of central Nebraska. According to Leah's brother, Barry was abusive to Leah, which is why she decided to leave. Her son stayed in Arkansas with Barry, a decision I'm sure wasn't easy for Leah to make. After settling down in Nebraska, Leah began working at a gas station while also clerking for an auction company. A year later, Leah moved 25 miles away to Cossett, Nebraska, a small town with about 3,800 people located just off Interstate 80, which stretches across the United States from California to New Jersey. Now, Kazad was the type of place where people didn't bother locking their doors or taking their keys out of their cars. Nothing bad really happened there, and they all trusted each other. Now, Leah had made the move to Kazad to be closer to her boyfriend, who worked part-time as a dispatcher for the Kazad Police Department, and apparently the relationship was getting pretty serious. One of Leah's co-workers later told the Lincoln Journal Star that Leah's boyfriend was the quote, most special thing in her life at the time. Leah also found a job at the Amico gas station on Meriden Avenue, which was near the Cossard Interchange off Interstate 80. Now this area mainly serves travelers who need to take a quick break, get gas, or use the restroom. And besides the Amico, there were two other gas stations and a hotel nearby. In order to reach these businesses from the interstate, you'd take the Kazid exit and head north, and almost immediately you'd come to Meriden Avenue. If you turned left on Meriden Avenue, you'd find several businesses including Amico. Alternatively, if you didn't turn on Meriden and continued north, you'd soon reach the actual town of Kazid. Okay, so now that we've gotten that out of the way and I feel like we have a, an understanding of the layout of the land, let's turn our attention back to Leah, because by early 1997, Things were actually going pretty well for her. She was 41 years old, she was working at Amico, and on March 9th, she was actually promoted to manager 
which was the perfect position for her based on her personality. Now on the following day, March 10th, Leah worked the Monday morning shift and it was her first day as manager. Unfortunately, it would also be her last. Just after 10.30 a.m., Leah was shot and killed while on the job. Details on how she was found have not been released publicly, but it's likely that a customer found her and called 911. When the police arrived, they reviewed the gas station's surveillance cameras and found footage of Leah's murder. Let's walk through what they saw on that tape. According to the Lincoln Journal Star, at 10.23 a.m., a red two-door Pontiac Grand Am pulled up to the gas pump outside of Amico. The police noticed the car didn't have a front license plate, and while there was a rear license plate, it was too blurry to read. At 10.24, the driver, a white man with short dark hair, got out of the car. He notably wasn't wearing any shoes and had dark sweatpants pulled up to his knees, along with a black or dark gray hooded sweatshirt and a bomber-style leather jacket. The man then started filling the Grand Dam with $17.20 worth of gas. At 10.28, the man walked into the store. Instead of heading straight to the counter to pay for his gas, he walked around, waiting for a mother and daughter to finish their purchase and leave. While waiting, he grabbed a soda from the cooler, opened it, and took a drink. At 10.32, the man approached the counter where Leah was working. As she rang up the soda and put it in a bag, they exchanged words. Now, unfortunately, the cameras didn't record sound, so the police couldn't hear what was being said. But judging from what happened next, it seems like he told her that he was robbing the store. Leah opened the cash register and gave him the money he demanded. He then told her to lie down behind the counter, which he also did. The surveillance camera at this point caught a clear view of the man's face as he waited for a minute, and then he took out a 9mm semi-automatic pistol from his right pocket. At 10.34 a.m., he leaned over the counter and shot Leah three times. According to the Lincoln County Crime Stoppers, two bullets hit Leah's arm, while the third bullet struck her in the left side of the head, killing her instantly. The gunman then left the store, taking the soda, a pack of cigarettes, a lighter, and $150 in cash. He got into his Grand Dam and drove away at 10.35 a.m. And unfortunately, the direction he went was not captured on video. Now, from watching the footage, the police believe that Leah's death was the result of a robbery and not a targeted attack. I'm going to weigh in on that more during the perspective at the end of the episode, but I, I will say there's been a couple different things that have been speculated about as far as this robbery is concerned. The fact that the, the man was barefoot, some people have suggested that potentially he was a transient, but then at the same time he was driving a newer car and had a leather jacket. So, you know, do, do transients usually dress like that? Do they usually have vehicles? Could the bare feet mean something else? Again, it's it's all speculation. As far as the robbery itself, normally for a, a soda and a pack of cigarettes and $150 in cash, you're not usually going to kill the clerk. And the only reason you would potentially do that was to leave no witnesses. But again, I want to dive more into that when we get to the, the end of the episode. Now, before we continue with this case, let's stop and take a quick break for our sponsor of this week's episode, Fume. Okay, have you ever tried to break a bad habit and felt like you're climbing Mount Everest in flip-flops? Yeah, I've been there too. But here's a breath of fresh air. It's Fume. And it's not about giving up. It's about switching up. And Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. Listen, instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy, and it makes replacing your bad habit that much easier. Your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful when de-stressing and reducing anxiety while breaking your bad habit. I will say the taste is great. I'm using the orange vanilla right now. It's probably my favorite flavor, but what I like even more than the taste is the actual design of Fume. Uh, it, it looks high-end, it feels high-end, 
and I do find myself just holding it in my hand and twisting it and pulling the magnets apart. It's just really well made and it's a, re it's a really cool design. Plus, Fume just released a magnetic stand for your Fume, so there's no more losing it around the house, and it's built with fidgeting in mind as well. You can actually spin your Fume around while it's on the stand. It's pretty cool. So start your year off right with a good habit by going to tryfume.com slash detective and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving my listeners and viewers of this show 10% off when they use my code detective to help make starting a good habit that much easier. Once again, go check them out, guys. That's trifume.com slash detective with my code detective. Okay, let's get right back into it. After watching the surveillance footage, a manhunt for the gunman began with officers from Kazad Police, Dawson County Sheriff's Office, Nebraska State Patrol, and other agencies joining in. By nightfall, they hadn't located the gunman or his car. Meanwhile, the residents of Kazad, who hadn't experienced a murder in years, were stunned by Leah's death. The mayor told the Kearney Hub, quote, People are shocked and they're hurt. They don't want this to happen in their little town, and that's the way I feel too. Leah's murder really shattered their small town innocence, prompting residents to start locking their doors and removing keys from their cars for the first time in years. By the next day, March 11th, the killer still hadn't been found. The police assured the media that they were tirelessly working to apprehend the killer, with many investigators not sleeping the night before. The police discussed the surveillance footage and shared still images, describing the perpetrator as a white male in his early 20s or 30s, approximately 6 feet to 6 feet 3 inches tall, and weighing about 200 to 225 pounds. The police did warn that he might still be driving the Red Grand Am, and could be armed with a 9mm handgun. Now, obviously, this is a, a really dangerous situation for everyone involved. Uh, law enforcement officers trying to track him down, but also the community. This individual, if they feel like the law enforcement is on to them and they've already proven that they're capable of killing another human being, they could get desperate and take hostages you could have a situation where someone else approaches them not knowing who they are and they are hurt or killed in the process. Or if this individual runs out of money or needs gas, they could stop at another gas station and, and kill another clerk. So a lot going on here. There's definitely a sense of urgency to identify this individual and apprehend them as soon as possible. By March 13th, with no sign of the gunman, Amico and a resident of Kazad offered a $12,000 reward for information leading to this person's apprehension. The Associated Press reported that around this time, the police decided to create a website which featured the reward and stills from the surveillance footage. Their aim was to reach as many people in the United States as possible, and they thought a website was a great way to do that. On March 17th, a week had passed since Leah was murdered, and the police were still searching for the killer. At this point, they were willing to try anything to solve the case, including hiring a hypnotist to interview witnesses, such as the woman and her daughter, who, as I said earlier, were present at the gas station when the killer initially entered. Additionally, eight officers returned to the Amico to interview passing drivers who might have been there around the time of the murder, hoping to gather any useful information, including potentially the Grand Dam's license plate number, which obviously would have been a major break in the case. The Kazad police chief told the Associated Press that although the investigation had generated many leads, they hadn't identified a solid suspect yet. He remained hopeful for an arrest, but was prepared for a lengthy investigation. The chief emphasized that the department welcomed any suggestions or new ideas to solve the murder. He noted that all law enforcement officers involved, including those from the Dawson County Sheriff's Office, were diligently pursuing all leads. After this update from the police, reporting on the case slowed down. In late June, America's Most Wanted aired a segment on Leah's murder, resulting in more than 30 leads. Unfortunately, none of them led to a breakthrough in the case. In March of 1998, one year had passed since Leah's murder. Investigators from different agencies were still working hard on the case. The Associated Press reported that the Nebraska State Patrol was checking into various possible suspects with the help from the FBI. The Kazad police said their latest effort was distributing a new flyer with an enhanced photo of the gunman 
and details about the now $22,000 reward. They made at least 500 copies of the flyer, sending them to police agencies nationwide and placing them in truck stops along the interstate. Additionally, they sent the flyer to Stars and Stripes, a military newspaper distributed worldwide. But unfortunately, none of these efforts led to the killer's capture. By March of 1999, two years had passed since Leah's murder. The police reiterated that the case remained open and active, and they would continue to search for the gunman until the case was solved. After this, news coverage on the case significantly slowed down. In January of 2002, the police enhanced the surveillance footage again. They shared the stills from the footage and mentioned that after enhancing the video, they now thought the killer could be older than initially guessed, maybe in his late 20s to mid 30s when the crime occurred. Additionally, they suggested that the car involved might be a Grand Am SE model with custom wheels or hubcaps, possibly manufactured between 1992 and 1995. These enhanced images were later shown on America's Most Wanted, leading to even more tips, but again, none led to a breakthrough in the case. Now, in February of 2003, there was a new potential lead in the case. The Associated Press reported that someone contacted America's Most Wanted after watching a rerun about Leah's murder. The caller, who wished to remain anonymous, shared that about five years earlier, an acquaintance from Omaha confessed to killing a store clerk and even showed him the gun that he used. The caller mentioned that it wasn't until watching the crime reenactment on America's Most Wanted that he took the confession seriously. However, he could only recall the guy's first name and he wasn't completely sure if he even remembered that correctly. Now this tip led the police to speculate that maybe the killer was living in Omaha around the time of the shooting, so they asked the public for additional information, but then, just a few days later, the police said the tip didn't lead to any solid evidence and it was nothing to confirm that what the tipster said was even true. By March of 2004, it had been seven years since Leah was killed. The police told the Lincoln Journal Star that they still thought that Leah had been targeted, quote, only because where she was. They said the killer's violent and risky behavior during the crime made them think he was either dead or in jail, adding, quote, you don't do something like this and all of a sudden you change your ways. The police said they believed someone out there might recognize the killer but was too scared to come forward. And I know that we hear this statement a lot, right, where police will come out and say someone knows something and you like to think that that's always the case, although unfortunately it's not. But in Leah's investigation, I do believe that may be the case. You have a situation here where you have a pretty clear photo. So why has no one come forward? Is it because they know this individual and it's a family member or a friend and they out of love for them or loyalty, they're not going to come forward? Is it out of fear, like law enforcement suggested? Or is it just a code where... This individual has has been brought up believing that it's wrong to uh, snitch on your friends to the cops. That is also a, a reality of what we deal with. And I think it's our job as law enforcement officers, and even as I'm sitting here doing this, to keep pounding the pavement, to keep putting it out there. Maybe this person who's out there is seeing all of this because they can't help but watch it and feel guilty and you never know what it's going to take, what word or what phrase or just a picture that they're going to see for them finally to say, you know what, I can't do it anymore. I have to come forward. That's why we we stay consistent and disciplined and determined as law enforcement agencies, even though in some cases it may seem redundant, it's important to keep doing it because you never know how close you are to getting that person to finally fold and say, you know what, I got to go speak to police. Now, after this, there were very few updates in Leah's case for the next five years until 2010, when cold cases from Nebraska, including Leah's, were featured on a deck of playing cards, which were distributed in jails and prisons. The police put out a statement about these cards saying, quote, the public is encouraged to view the cards and provide any information they may have about a case. The victims depicted in the deck are someone's mother, father, sister, brother, wife, husband or child. You may think that your information is not important or would not be helpful, but any tip or lead might be the missing link that may solve a case and bring resolution to a victim's loved ones. Now, just as a side note, Leah was on the Queen of Spades 
And it's important to mention that on the card, her age was wrong. They had her listed as 31, but as I said earlier, she was actually 41. In November of 2015, the lead detective on Leah's case spoke to NTV and shared some new details. He mentioned that after the suspect grabbed the soda from inside the gas station, he actually opened it, looked into the camera in the store's corner, and took a drink. The detective described the killer as being, quote, very brazen, very confident in what he was doing. He also noted that because the killer leaned over and shot Leah in the head in broad daylight, her murder seemed even more cold-blooded than usual. The detective said FBI profilers believed that Leah's murder was a random crime of opportunity. The gunman, quote, appeared to be very experienced and potentially not his first, nor probably his last time he committed a crime of this nature. The detective also revealed that the police recovered the killer's fingerprints. Despite this, they still hadn't been able to make an identification. The detective said, quote, It seems like it's so close and so solvable, but yet so far away. Leah's brother Roy also spoke to NTV about Leah and his theories about the case. He believed that Leah's ex-husband Barry, who had passed away earlier that year, might be responsible for Leah's murder. Roy mentioned that about a year before Leah was killed, she wrote a 16-page handwritten letter to her sons explaining why she had to leave their dad. In that letter, she described in detail how abusive Barry had been to her. Roy said he thought that it was possible that Barry hired someone to kill Leah, and one reason he thought Barry was involved was because the way the killer was dressed. Roy explained, quote, This guy who killed my sister comes into that gas station with clam diggers on. That's when your pants are rolled up to your knees, and that's what people wear in the Southern Hemisphere. So this guy is in Nebraska, which is not warm, comes in with his pants rolled up, which tells me I think he's from St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands, and I think my brother-in-law paid him to come up and shoot my sister. Now here's the interesting twist. NTV asked the lead detective about Roy's theories, and I expected him maybe not to dismiss them completely, but tamper them down a little bit based on what FBI profilers were saying and based on what he had already said publicly, but that's, that's not what he did. He actually said it could be right. He had looked into Leah's past and learned that she might have taken money from Barry when she left him. The detective went on to say, quote, I could see how he could be so frustrated if she took money from him and left him like she did that he had somebody come up and have her executed. I thought this was fascinating. Again, I did not expect it to go this way, but I do appreciate the fact that even though the detective has certain things that are leading him to believe one thing, he's still open to any and all ideas as far as potential scenarios or theories surrounding Leah's death. So kudos to him on this one. Now, the lead detective also told NTV that with time and technology and science constantly improving, they hoped that the cold case would eventually be closed. He said, quote, we are never going to give up on Leah, so it's our duty and obligation to make sure we follow up on every potential lead. I would hope that he's somewhere close because I hope to live to see the day to look him in the eye and tell him he's been caught. Unfortunately, that is the last update we have in this case. There hasn't been much media reporting in the last eight years, but I know that Leah's family is still seeking answers and searching for her killer. All right, so let's dive into this perspective and I want to go right to the fingerprints because I'm sure a lot of you had the reaction that I had when I first read this, which is, okay, we have fingerprints, we have a photo, we have a potential suspect vehicle. How hasn't this guy been caught yet? Well, let's, let's talk about the fingerprints and I don't want to diminish their importance, but not all fingerprints are created equally. And this is where something, you know, at the top of the show, I said, what am I contributing to this? This is something I can actually shed light on. So I've, I've had a lot of experience with fingerprints and they can be demoralizing, right? You get them, you're excited about them. And then once you get them actually processed, they're not as good as you thought. So you could have a couple issues. It could be smudged. Um, it could be a partial print. They could be overlapping. And with fingerprint identification, you're looking for uh, ridge identification marks, points, and to make a, a match to a pr another print or to enter it in a system, you're going to need at least, depending on the person processing it, it could be anywhere from 
eight to 12 points that would match up with a potential suspect print or even 10 to 12. Some, some even want more than that for it to be admissible in, in court or, or, or submitted as far as the arrest affidavit is concerned. It all depends on the quality of the print. So I don't know what the print consists of. Maybe if they had a potential suspect, even if it's a partial, they would be able to print that person and compare the partial to the to the print that they have, the full print they have of the suspect. That might help. But would it be the the smoking gun? Probably not. Probably not. It would be a totality of things, and the fingerprint identification would just be the the icing on the cake. So that's that's the fingerprints. Let's talk about the car. The car has never been found. So I'm assuming that this car wasn't stolen and then used in this crime. More than likely, this vehicle belongs to the suspect. And that's that's interesting to me. That's interesting that the photo coupled with the vehicle that has some potential distinguishing remark uh, marks on it with the hubcaps and the wheels, the fact that no one out there has said, oh, that person kind of looks like so-and-so. And you know what's odd? So-and-so actually has a Pontiac Grand Am SE. You would think that's how the correlation would be and that's how it would be connected and we would be sitting here talking about how this case was solved and not what we're currently talking about now, which is we still don't know who this guy is. So that's a little concerning to me because I find it hard to believe that no one would make that connection, which goes back to what we were saying earlier in the episode as far as maybe he has been identified by someone out there, but for the reasons I listed before, they're just... They're not willing to come forward, and that's that's unfortunate. I hope that if by any chance they're listening to this, something in this episode tonight, you know, causes them to do the right thing. But 27 years later, uh, I'm not very hopeful for that. Now let's talk about the suspect himself because interesting behavior here, and there's a couple ways to look at it, and I think we have to really dissect this because. First off, he's walking through the store barefoot. He could be leaving trace DNA behind, although DNA was not as prevalent in 1997 as far as the processing of it. So maybe he wasn't that concerned about that. But let's talk about the fact that he didn't cover his face. And as the detective said, he goes in there, he takes a drink, looks directly at the camera, doesn't really care. Why is that? If he's so concerned about you know, withholding his identification and, and not being, you know, pinned for this for this robbery, he would have done something to prevent law enforcement from potentially identifying him. He did nothing like that. So what do we take from that? First off, is this guy, and I'm not saying this in a joking manner, is this guy all there? Is he mentally stable? Or is this someone who is just not in the right mindset, maybe on drugs, maybe mentally ill? And is going in there with a complete disregard because they're not in the right uh, mental capacity. I don't think that's the case, but I'm throwing it out there as a potential scenario. And the other reason I bring this up is because you could say that potentially Leah was murdered. If you were going to go this route, you could say he killed her because he was concerned she would identify him later. Well, well, clearly that wasn't the case. Clearly he wasn't concerned about being identified because, again, he, he looked right at the camera. He knew they were there, and yet he, he wasn't concerned at all. And the reason I bring that up is because of the final point I want to make tonight. What's interesting is that FBI profilers and even law enforcement agencies have said they believe that this was just a crime of opportunity and, and Leah was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know if I believe that. I also don't know if I believe Roy's theory that it's connected to Barry, but it could be somewhere in the middle. It could be somewhere in the middle, and 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 there might be someone in Leah's past, maybe Barry, maybe somebody else, who had an axe to grind with her. And the reason I say that is if you look at that still image, this murder was deliberate, and it makes me wonder if the robbery was a diversion was just a decoy to potentially throw law enforcement off. But in reality, the whole purpose for this individual going there was to kill Leah Rollins. And again, when you watch that photo, and it's a horrific photo to look at, you can see that he is making sure that she's dead. 
and it took him three shots to do so, but he, but, but he did what he wanted to do. And, and I don't think he did it because she was going to, you know, go to the police after the fact and identify him. I do not think he was concerned about that based on his, his overall behavior. So we're looking at a real situation here that could be a premeditated murder, a, a, a hit, if you will, that was carried out by an individual who had a direct issue with her, or as Roy suggested, he was someone who was hired to kill her on behalf of someone else. I don't know. I think that's something where investigators, which it appears based on what the detective said, uh, they would have to look into her past and see what enemies she had out there. And maybe it would connect back to someone. It'd, it'd be tough, again, at this point, but if the initial steps were taken where they looked into her past... Maybe there's some names floating out around out there that could be looked into further. You just you just never know. The only other thing I would suggest about this case, and it may not even be the situation, we know that these enhanced stills were taken from a video. This is 1997 that we're talking about, 27 years ago. So the video quality is probably not as good. It may not, it may the frame rate might even be very low. But I would love to see that video, if possible, just to see if maybe there's a type of walk or a posture about this person that may be identifiable to somebody who knows him. Uh, again, it's a long shot and the video quality may not allow that. But at this point, if you're releasing the enhanced stills, why not just release the entire video? Not of the actual murder, but at least of him walking around uh, in the store and out at the at the gas pump. If you have it, it's 27 years ago. You might as well put it out there. You, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So that's where I stand on this one. Really looking at it, if you if you made me choose right now, I, I would actually go against what law enforcement and the FBI believe in this one, that this was just a random act of violence and, and ultimately Leah was uh, just collateral damage. I, it doesn't, the behavior displayed at that gas station to me does not suggest that. It suggests that this person went in there, they waited for the two other witnesses to leave, they took the money and the cigarettes and the soda because they wanted those items. They were, they were an afterthought. The main reason he was there was to kill Leah Rollins. That's, that's, what, that's what I would lean towards at this point. But as I said at the top of the show, it's, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about someone out there who is from that area or from that surrounding community and may have information that might solve this case. So just to recap, on March 10th, 1997, Leah Rollins was working at the Amico gas station off Interstate 80 in Kaza, Nebraska. Just after 10.30 a.m., a white male with short dark hair in his late 20s to mid-30s, maybe even a little older, standing at around 6 foot to 6 foot 3 inches tall, robbed Leah and then shot her three times with a 9 millimeter handgun. One minute later, he drove off in a red two-door Grand Am, potentially a SE model, and it could range from 1992 to 1995. And if you have any information about this case, please call the Kazad Police Department at 308-784-2366. I want to send my thoughts out to Leah's family. I know it has been a long time. 27 years without answers is a long time to wait. Uh, obviously, you don't deserve that. But what I would tell you is stay strong. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. And as the detective said, with the advancements in science and technology and the amount of evidence that we have in this case, that at least what's been released publicly, with those advancements, there is still a potential that if this person's out there, we could identify him and he could be captured very soon. It could happen tomorrow. So until that day comes, we will be here with you, supporting you every step of the way. As for everyone else out there, stay safe out there and I will see you next week. <laughs>